live facebook live from medina at the hardware store in the parking lot yeah yep that's where we get our internet that's where we get our free internet <laughs> for everybody out there who's curious we get that free internet yes yeah so how are you oh, i'm pretty good how are you good yes good. yes so we have a Bible study. Yes, I'm just waiting. I'm not going to ask. <laughs> okay, well, then okay, I'll okay. ask. Okay, okay. What, what's your social security number? Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> the damage I could do with that. <laughs> oh, man. I trust you. I trust you. Because I know you love me. <laughs> I do love you. I know you. I love you, too. Anyways, we got a Bible study. Okay. Yes, yes. Uh, let's see. Oh, Paula Bowie's here. Awesome. Good to see you, Paula Bowie. Cindy's here. My mom's here. I thank you all for taking the time to come. We're just being who we are. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And so, let's see. What should we say? Should we uh, say hi to some people? Well, we did. We did. Well. That's true. That's true. There's more people coming. Hello to all the family of God. Matthew, uh, Don. Hey, everybody. Ed, Felicia, Emily, J. Clarissa. We love y'all. All right. Well, I say we pray. I'm ready. Okay. Let's pray and get going. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the beautiful day of the Sabbath. As we celebrate your love, we know that you love us as no one else could. And you've given Jesus to show us what exactly that love looks like. So we thank you, Heavenly Father, for your manifold blessings. We don't even know them all. And so as we journey into this study, we realize our need of you and that we're desperate for your spirit. So Lord, speak through us hide us in your hand and pour your spirit into us as a river so that we might serve you and serve others in jesus name amen amen, amen. april hecock good to see you happy sabbath to all the hecocks hello mom it's nice to see y'all i think we're going to see the hecocks in october october, october. Where are we going in october? Iowa. Iowa. yeah oh, okay. yeah Okay, so we got a Bible study, and the Bible study today is about the power of Satan in the knowledge of good and evil and how it plays out in the world today. And so, of course, we're going to get to our main Bible studies. First one is 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Right? This love is agape. If we don't understand agape, then we're not going to be able to understand God because God is agape in character and method and principle. Psalm 18 verse 30 says that God is perfect. And Malachi chapter 3 verse 6 says that God is unchangeable. These are our essentials that we go to for every Bible study. We have three core Bible study principles that we use. Bible study principle number one, God is agape. That's perfect self-control that's considering others more important than you consider yourself and that's not being personally offended by others sins this is how God is with all of humanity it doesn't matter who you are and once we behold this and once we fix our minds on this it's actually who we become and you can look at a deeper description of how God's agape love is in 1 Corinthians 13 4 to 7 second core Bible study principle that we have is that Jesus the only begotten Son of God is the ultimate revelation of the Father John 14 9 if you have seen me you have seen the Father very important third core Bible study principle that we use is that biblical principle explains scripture and scripture explains biblical principle this is found in Isaiah 28 10 for precept must be upon precept precept upon precept line upon line line upon line here a little there a little and today we're going to talk about the power of satan and how god reveals it to us in the book of revelation but before we do that i do want to apologize this is important to me as an individual i do want to apologize because in the last study when we were talking about god's power and authority i misspoke about something and I know a lot of people are going to say it's not a big deal. It is to me. Because as we are doing Bible studies and people are listening to what we have to say, uh, we don't want to put a wrong idea out there. Because we don't want to put this idea that's kind of misspoken about the character of God. And so I was talking about somebody asking me how I run the wood shop and what my authority is. And I, miss, I, I misspoke and I said, do you love me? Do you trust me? 
Yes, yes. But that's not what I meant to say. What I meant to say was, do you know that I love you and do you trust me? And that's all the authority I need over anybody that's in my circle of influence. My wife, my family, my mom, whoever you are, my friends, my enemies, right? And so it's very important for me to get that out. Set the record straight in my own mind. And last study, we looked at God's power of love, his truth, his freedom, his creation, his power to sustain, his power over time, and his power of forgiveness. And the point of all of that was that God's power over us was to protect us, it was to s sustain us, it was to love us, it was to grow us in agape, it was to heal us, it was to save us. I totally get that God is a creator and it's right and just that he has authority over us. But the reality is, is God's view of authority in our minds is he just wants to know that we love him and that, that he just wants us to know that he loves us and we trust him. And so God's authority is based on our understanding that God uses his power to love us. That's it. And that we trust him with his power to love us, to protect us, and to sustain us. So God's authority is not to rule over us as a dictator, but his authority is as a role model and as a friend. John 15, 15. John 15, 15 says this, Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knows not what his Lord does. But I call you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. This is God's desire for us is to be his friend and what kind of friend would seek to have worldly power and worldly authority over another friend not a good one and so a true friend would always give love and expect trust in return this is the basis for God's authority the love of a father based on the trust of a children this is not how Satan's power operates this is not how Satan's authority operates Revelation chapter 5, verse 6. Revelation 5, 6 says this. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into the whole world. So this is what we see. We see a slain lamb. We see seven horns, seven eyes, and seven spirits. We talked about this, that this is Jesus wielding the full power of the Godhead, protecting us, saving us, sustaining life through the character, the method, the principles of God's agape love. We see one beast, a lamb. We see one head, Jesus Christ, the full revelation of God's love. And we see seven horns, or the completeness of the power of divinity. This is how God describes his government in the book of Revelation. Through Jesus Christ, the seven horns, the lamb slain. And God does the exact same thing when he describes Satan's government in the book of Revelation. And what we see in Satan's government we see a description of a beast. We see horns. We see heads. And what God is showing us is how Satan rules the world while wielding all the power of the knowledge of good and evil in its fullness and in its, in its completeness. And this is how Satan governs humanity in symbols now. This is a symbolic thing God is showing us. And then he'll also reveal to us what it means. Revelation 13, 1 to 4. And I stood on the, the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were the feet of a bear and his mouth was the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat 
and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and this deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon which gave power to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? So we see one beast. We see seven heads. We see ten horns. And we see ten crowns. Now this actually changes. And I'm going to be saying probably a lot of new stuff for people who have been in present truth for a while. Stick with me. Hold on, and we're going to see a revelation of how Satan's government operates in this world. So, the beast of Revelation 13, one beast, seven heads, ten horns, and ten crowns. This changes in Revelation chapter 17. We see one beast, seven heads, ten horns, no crowns. Revelation 17, 3. Revelation 17, 3. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit on a scarlet-colored beast, full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Verse 7. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore dost thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman, and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath seven heads and ten horns. The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pits, and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names are not written in the book of life or the foundation of the world. And they beheld the beast that was, and is not, and is yet. And there is a mind, and here is the mind that has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. The, and there are seven kings, five are fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come, and when he comes he must continue a short space. The beast that was is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goes into perdition. The ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. So, a beast, Revelation chapter 13, one beast, seven heads, ten horns, ten crowns. This beast changes in Revelation 17. It's one beast, seven heads, ten horns, no crowns. So a change takes place. This beast represents Satan's government. All his power and the ideas or the, the, the thought heads that govern humanity. And we're going to talk about these two beasts in a moment. How they're really one beast that changes over time because of a specific thing that happens in history. So we're going to ask a question. What is a beast? Most of us know this. Daniel chapter 7 verse 23 says that the beast that thou sawest is the first kingdom. Right? Let's go to that. Daniel chapter 7 verse 23. So a beast is a kingdom. Daniel 7.23 says this. Thus he said, The fourth beast, which shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth. So in Daniel, we see these four beasts. These are superpowers. They're world-ruling powers. So a beast is a kingdom, but specifically a world-ruling government. Now, the beast is also described as other things. Uh, John chapter 1, verse 29, Behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. A lamb is also a beast of the field. And that beast, which is a gentle, non-violent beast, is a symbol for an individual, Jesus. So a beast can be an individual, but can also be a, a government, a world-ruling power. Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, Sometimes we forget that symbology in, in the Bible can have multiple meanings. And when we forget that, it can keep us in a narrow track view of our understanding. Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil. Now the serpent was the beast of the field. And this individual, the serpent, the beast of the field, that's Satan. Right? So... 
a beast can be a kingdom and it can be an individual. We want to remember that. It's very important that we don't get locked into one train of thought. What are horns in Scripture? Revelation chapter 5, 6, we saw that the seven horns that Jesus wields are the seven powers of divinity. But Satan also has horns, horns of wickedness. Psalms 75, 4. Psalm 75, verse 4 says this. I said unto the fools, deal not foolishly, and to the wicked, lift up not up the horn. Lift not up your horn on high and speak with a stiff neck. Verse 10, all the horns of the wicked also will I cut off, but the horn of the righteous shall be exalted. So the wicked also has power, which is symbolized in a horn. So the horns in Revelation 13 that are attached to the beast are a symbol for the power that it wields. But it can also be a symbol for the individual, too. Luke chapter 1, verse 69. And we want to go through this to have in our understanding that there are greater understandings than just one limited view in Scripture. God does this so that we can become critical thinkers and not get stuck with tunnel vision when we're trying to understand the Bible. Luke 1 69 and he raised up a horn of salvation a power of salvation for us in the house of David his servant servant this horn of salvation is Jesus Christ the individual king of the universe this is also used in another place as well Daniel chapter 8 verse 21 Daniel chapter 8 verse 21 now and the rough goat is the king of Greece and the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king for those of us who have been around the block we know that this horn is talking about Alexander the Great right and so a horn can be power and it can also be the individual who's wielding the power that's very important so often in Scripture biblical symbology will have multiple meanings these symbols can be used by God and by Satan so that they can reveal to us different aspects of what's happening happening in the great controversy and we don't want to get locked into the idea that only one view of biblical symbology is the only view we don't want to do that that's dangerous it prevents critical thinking and it can lead to wrong ideas so, Revelation 13 and Revelation 17 describe Satan's government in this earth as having one beast, ten horns, and seven heads, right? What do the seven heads represent in Scripture? Revelation 17, 9. What do the seven heads represent in Scripture? Revelation 17 9 and here is the mind that has wisdom the seven heads are seven hills are seven mountains on which the woman sits now we've been taught one thing that these seven hills are the seven hills of Rome but I'm gonna challenge people in present truth especially in the character of God movement that these seven heads which are seven mountains, are actually seven ideologies that the Satan uses to govern the minds of man across the entire world through his satanic government, right? Because think about it. The head is where we think. It's where we reason. It's where we determine what's best for my life, right? The head is where we worship. The head is where our understanding is. And the mountain, is, we're given two symbols here to understand this. The mountain, or the high places, is where people in the past, especially the children of Israel, is where they associated the presence of God with. Matthew, John chapter 4, verse 20. John 4, verse 20.
Here we go. John 4, verse 20. The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. The woman saith unto him, Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour comes when ye shall neither worship in this mountain, nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. So what mountain do we worship in? In this mountain or in Jerusalem, which is in the Mount of Moriah? It's very important, right? Our thoughts, our views about God are connected to mountains because these are the high places in our life that are to draw us up closer to the character and understanding of God. God has a mountain. Satan has a mountain. Psalm chapter 2, verse 6. Psalm chapter 2, verse 6 says, Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. So the true mountain of God is where Jesus is. There's other mountains where Jesus is not. These mountains are idolatry. And according to the book of Revelation, there's seven hills of idolatry. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 6. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 6. The Lord said unto me in the days of Josiah the king, Hast thou seen which backsliding Israel has done? She has gone up upon every high mountain and under every green tree and has played the harlot. Very important, right? Israel plays the harlot on a mountain. The harlot in Revelation 17 sits on seven mountains. This is a symbol for the the idolatry or governing principles the wrong perspective that man has about God so the seven heads in Revelation that the beast has are seven hills which represent seven central ide ideologies that govern the minds of humanity in Satan's government we're going to talk about that more in a minute but in Revelation 13 and in Revelation 17, God is describing Satan's earthly government, and he uses the symbol of one beast, seven heads, and ten horns. It's important because the number ten represents the completeness of earthly things. Right? There in uh, the parable of. Uh, the wise, and, the, the wise and foolish virgins. We see ten virgins, five wise, five foolish. This symbolizes the wheat and the tares. This symbolizes the completeness of the worldwide church. There are ten commandments that were given to fallen humanity. This symbolizes the completeness of the duties of love mankind is to perform to God and their fellow man. We see ten toes in Daniel. This is the completeness of the powers of earth at the second coming of Christ. So the number ten represents the completeness of earthly things. And so seven ha uh, Satan has ten horns because his power is completed in an earthly way symbolically in this image. right? The number seven, the seven heads. We saw that the number seven represents the completion of spiritual things either holy or unholy right we saw that the the completion of creation was symbolized by the holy sabbath right you have jesus revelation 5 6 wielding the seven horns the seven eyes the seven spirits of holiness right the candlestick in the tabernacle the golden lampstand that had seven branches the completeness of holiness in the light that is given to the children of god very important you also have seven unholy things representing the complete spiritual corruption that satan does to the mind of humanity proverbs 6:16 6, Proverbs 6.16 6, these, these six things does the Lord hate. Yea, seven 
are an abomination unto him, a proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed blood, an evil heart that devises wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speak lies, and he that sows discord among the brethren. So seven spiritual abominations. There are also seven evil spirits. Matthew chapter 12, verse 43. Matthew chapter 12, verse 43. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walks through dry places seeking rest and finds none. Then he saith, I will return unto my house from whence I came out. And when he has come, he finds it empty, swept, and garnished. Then he goes and takes with him self seven other spirits more wicked than himself and they enter in and dwell there and the last state of that man is worse than the first even so shall it be unto this wicked generation so the seven heads represent the the complete spiritual corruption that satan brings forth from the knowledge of good and evil that infects the minds of humanity throughout the, the whole world the ten horns represents the earthly completeness of his power, and it's symbolized in this one beast. So in Revelation, Satan's government is symbolized by God to reveal to us how Satan's government operates and what it looks like. And we see one beast, we see ten horns, and we see seven heads. So as God describes Satan's government, he uses the symbol of a beast that devours. That's not like this, the lamb of, like Jesus, where it's a non-violent, gentle beast. No, God uses a beast that devours to describe how Satan's government interacts with man's kind. And he does it in a way where God describes the completeness of Satan's earthly powers as having ten horns. And he, said, he uses the seven heads as a way to describe the spiritual corruption that Satan does to humanity as the seven heads or the seven hills or the seven ideas of idolatry that corrupt the mind of mankind and God does this twice in Revelation he does it once in Revelation 13 and then he does it again in Revelation 17 Rep listen to this character of God movement Revelation 13 represents Satan his government his power and the spiritual corruption prior to the false second coming. Revelation 17 represents Satan, his government, his power, the spiritual corruption after the false second coming. These are two different beasts or they're two different phases in Satan's end time worldwide government. The beast of Revelation 13 is the world being run by the knowledge of good and evil prior to the worldwide spiritual corruption of the false second coming. The beast of Revelation 17 is the world being run by the knowledge of good and evil during, during the spiritual corruption of the false second coming. We'll see this in a moment. So let's look at Satan's power. Now, this power is run by the knowledge of good and evil, right? God's power in every facet had its core essence. All of God's power stems from this central fact that God is love. So all of God's horns, all of God's power were holy spiritual perfection of love. Satan's power in every facet stems from the knowledge of good and evil. And Satan has ten powers in the earth, unholy, spiritual, corruption in its completeness. Satan's powers are the power of lies. It's the power of knowledge or indoctrination. Satan's power is to create imposed laws. Satan's power is the power to accuse. It's the power to punish and condemn. Satan has the power to create value that's not there. Satan has the power to possess or own things. Think about that for a minute. Satan has the power of fear. Satan has the power of war. And Satan has the power of death. Satan has ten powers. All these powers come from the knowledge of good and evil. And all ten powers 
run every facet of society of society today and we're going to prove it let's look at these 10 powers the power of lies this is satan's power the power to speak falsely with the intention to deceive think about it that's exactly how it all got started in humanity in genesis chapter 3 this is satan this is where the source of his this is how his power infects our minds john chapter 8 verse 44 John chapter 8 verse 44 you are of your father the devil and the lust of your father ye will do he was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him when he speaks a lie he speaks of his own power for he is a liar and the father of it now think about it does the world today use the power of lies absolutely it does that power number one, the power of lies. Power number two, the power of knowledge. Now, this is not knowledge of truth. This is knowledge of lies and indoctrination. What is indoctrination? And not, indoctrination is the process of teaching a person or a group a set of beliefs not based in reality. Educating people without thinking critically. This is Satan's knowledge right it's indoctrination right and revelation chapter 12 verse 9 says this revelation chapter 12 verse 9 that and the great serpent was cast out that old serpent called the devil and satan which deceives the whole world satan deceives the whole world through his knowledge of lies and indoctrination and of course we're going to ask the question does the world today use the knowledge of indoctrination absolutely absolutely does satan's third power is the power to create and impose laws now satan is not a creator he doesn't have the ability or power to create reality only god has that power so instead of because he doesn't have the power to create reality he creates rules or laws with the idea that his rules and his laws will create order that's important and so the satan's power to create and impose rules and laws this governs humanity as well revelation 13 13 and he does great wonders so that he makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men and deceives them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles he had power to do in the sight of the beast saying unto them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image this is a law now which had the wound by a sword and did live and he had power to give life unto the beast uh, uh, unto the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed and he causes all both small great rich and poor free and bond to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead and that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast this is the culmination of satan power to create laws after the false second coming he's going to create a system that says you can't buy you can't sell unless you worship this it's very important does the world today use the power of created and imposed law it does it absolutely does and satan's fourth power is the power to accuse right that's the power to watch over others looking for someone who is breaking the rules right the this power doesn't just accuse people it polices them and revelation chapter 12 verse 10 says that satan is the accuser of the brethren he's the one that watches over people looking for them to break rules so he can police them does the world today use this power to accuse and police people it does the power to enforce punishment also comes from satan right his fifth power is the power of punishment and condemnation the power to enforce a punishment or condemn others because of the rules that they were found breaking that very important 
First Timothy chapter three verse six says this. First Timothy chapter three verse six says this. Not a novice, least being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. This is the power of Satan to find people breaking the rules and then to condemn them. Does the world today use the power of punishment and condemnation on those they consider rule breakers? Yes, absolutely does. So you can see how the world uses every single power that Satan has created through the knowledge of good and evil. Right? There's another power Satan has, the power to create value. Right? In Satan's system, value is created under specific conditions. Value is based on beauty. It's based on strength. It's based on intelligence. It's based on how scarce something is. Value is based on greed, supply and demand. Value is based on misrepresentation. Right? So you can have a, a, a value that's good. You can also have a value that's evil. And Satan says, if you have these things, you're valuable. And he also says, if you don't have these things, you're not valuable. Matthew chapter 4, verse 6. Matthew chapter 4, verse 6. We see Satan trying to do this to Jesus. Matthew 4, 6. And saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, if you, are, if you have the value of the Son of God, Cast yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee in their hands, and they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. Jesus saith unto him, It is written, Again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. So Satan is telling Jesus, Do something to prove your value. Do something to prove who you are. Ezekiel 28:16. Ezekiel 28, 16. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled thee with violence. And thou hast sinned, therefore I will cast thee out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by the reason of thy brightness. And I will cast thee to the ground, and I will lay thee before kings, that they may behold thee. Thou hast filled thy sanctuaries by the multitude, thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, and by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore I will bring forth a fire from the midst of thee, and I will devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. So this system of iniquity, this knowledge of good and evil, it creates an inappropriate value system that lifts up some and defiles, brings down others, defiles everybody. But it's an inappropriate value system. And of course, we're going to ask the question, does the world today use the power of creating value? And absolutely does. Satan also has the power of ownership, right? Ownership is the act or the state or the right to possess something. Now, if we use our critical thinking mind, Psalm chapter 4, verse 21 says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and they that dwell therein, everything is God's. All people, all the gold, everything, cattle on a thousand hills, everything belongs to the Lord. We're simply stewards of what he has given us. But Satan says, you don't have to be a steward of God. You can take from God and own it yourself. Matthew chapter 4, verse 8 and 9. Matthew chapter 4, verse 8 and 9. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, and show him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And he said unto him, all these things will I give you, if you will fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Satan says, If you do what I say, I will reward you with possessions. You won't have to be God's steward. We'll steal from God. If you work hard enough, 
if you're part of the right family, if you're lucky enough, if you lie, cheat, and steal, you'll be rewarded with owning possessions. You'll own things. Everything's God's. We own nothing. We're simply stewards of His. If you're in the good side of the knowledge of good and evil, you'll earn your possessions. If you're in the bad side of the knowledge of good and evil, you'll steal them. Does the world use this power of ownership today? Yes, it absolutely does. And we can see how the knowledge of good and evil is really a worldwide governing system that's a reward and punishment system. The whole world uses this, and we've been deceived and blinded to it. Another one of Satan's powers is the power of fear. Fear is the power to instill in one's mind an unpleasant thought, an unpleasant emotion that someone or something is dangerous. 1 Peter 5.8 1 Peter 5.8 says this. 1 Peter 5, 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Right? Satan roars like a lion, and stealing fear with lies. A lion is very loud. It says that God speaks to us through the still, small voice. So Satan's roaring with lies is by design to try to drown out the still small voice of God's love. This is all by design of Satan's wicked mind. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14 says this, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Satan is the one who instigates fear, which leads to the bondage of sin, which leads to death. 1 John 4.18 says this. 1 John chapter 4 verse 18. There is no fear in agape. There is no fear in divine love. But perfect love, divine love, casts out fear, because fear hath torment. He that fears is not made perfect in agape. That's very important. Think about these questions. Do governments use fear to manipulate and coerce their people? Yes, they do. Do schools use fear and manipulation to coerce their people into submission? They do. Do jobs, do churches use fear manipulation and coercion to get their people to submit they do do families use fear manipulation and coercion to get their people to submit they do all of society runs off a satanic fear-based system a system that literally breeds ignorance through its indoctrination that ignorance produces fear that fear produces hatred. That hatred becomes war. And this is how Satan has the power of war. It's through the ignorance he creates, which causes fear, which causes hatred, which becomes war. So Satan has the power of war. And war is a conflict between two groups. Usually it's an armed conflict. And this is what the Bible says, Revelation 12:7. Revelation chapter 12, verse 7 says this. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against, they fought against the devil. And the devil and the dragon fought and his angels. See, Satan tried to usurp the throne of God. He presented the knowledge of good and evil to the angels as well. And there was a war in heaven. It was a war of words. It wasn't a physical war. But Satan started the war. Jesus ended the war in heaven. Right? Does the world use the power of war today? It does, absolutely does. And Satan's final power is the power of death. This is the power of taking life. And Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14 says that it's Satan who has the power of death. 
Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. That through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Does the world today use the power of death? It absolutely does. So these are the ten powers. These are the ten horns in the beast of Revelation 13 and Revelation 17. These are the powers of Satan. These are the powers that the world uses to govern itself. The power of lies, the power of knowledge or indoctrination, the power of creative imposed laws, the power to accuse, the power to punish, the power to create value, the power of ownership, the power of fear, the power of war, the power of death. And this is so woven into the fabric of our reality and our minds that we actually can't imagine a society not run by these powers because throughout human history these have been the only things to run every aspect of human society very important so the seven heads the seven hills the seven ideas that govern man's mind in this satanic system this is going to probably sound like a radical thing, but these are seven main philosophies that humanity uses either to worship God or not to worship God, right? And this is seven heads, seven hills, seven ideas. The ideas are paganism, atheism, Eastern mysticism, Judaism, Roman Catholicism, Protestantism, and Islam. This is going to sound funny, but these are seven paradigms that the world uses with the ten powers of Satan to govern mankind. And Satan doesn't care what head you use. He doesn't care if you use Protestantism. He doesn't care if you use Catholicism. He doesn't care if you use atheism. As long as you use his idea and his power, he doesn't care how you fall in to his Babylonian satanic web of deception, right? And the deception is so deep and it's so scary that some of these heads use the name of God to rule over people. This is really the deception of Revelation 12, 9, right? Paganism is nature worship. It uses blood sacrifice to appease an angry God. That's a worldview that infects most of the religious world today, even Christianity. Atheism is not acknowledging a deity at all or divine law. That's another worldview. Another one is Eastern mysticism. This includes every form of ancestor worship. It includes pantheism, which is uh, the entire universe is God. It includes the New Age, which says the, the energies of the universe are um, channeled or rejected. Paganism, atheism, Eastern mysticism, Judaism. These things run whole nations, whole continents, whole aspects of society. And Judaism once carried the truth about God, but it focused on righteousness by works, and it rejected the Messiah. And once that took place, Jesus said, your house is left to you desolate, Matthew 23, 38. Another head is Roman Catholicism. Roman Catholicism is what early Christianity turned into once it united with pagan Rome. Catholicism uses the pagan idea of a blood atonement for the forgiveness of sins, and it changed the laws of God. Protestantism. Now, hear me out, fellow Protestants. My heart is the heart of a Protestant. But the reality is, is that once Christianity broke away from Catholicism, it became a Protestant, right? Yet... Protestantism still holds on to the idea that Jesus was a blood sacrifice to an angry God. That has its roots in paganism. That's a fact. That's just a fact. And the fourth or the seventh head, the seventh head is Islam, right? Islam broke away from paganism 
it became its own religion but it rejects Jesus as the only begotten Son of God and it claims the blessings of God from Abraham through Isaac through Ishmael and not Isaac that's very important and this sounds crazy this sounds new but this is how Satan runs the world through these seven different philosophies that govern the man, man's mind. If, it doesn't matter if it's in the Middle East or China or America. This is how Satan does it. And he does it with the ten powers. right? And a lot of these world views didn't exist when John wrote the book of Revelation. So how can I say these things? Revelation chapter 1 verse 1. Revelation chapter 1 verse 1 the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him to show unto his servants the things which must shortly come to pass so when John wrote these things some of the things existed in his time some of them didn't and God is giving this to John to tell us what the world is going to be like at the end of time so seven world views that dominate the minds of man and of course we're going to ask these questions does paganism and atheism use lies indoctrination impose laws accusations punishment created value ownership fear war and death to govern itself and others it does does eastern mysticism do the same thing it does does judaism use the powers of satan to govern itself and others it does does Islam do the same thing? It does. Does Roman Catholicism use the powers of Satan to govern others and itself? It does. Does Protestantism use force, manipulation, coercion, lies, indoctrination, impose laws, accusations, punishment to rule itself and others? It does. It does. Does America do it? It does. Does every government, every educational system, every financial system, every religious system in the world use the ten powers of Satan? They do. Now, this is a reality check for the character of God movement. Does 501c3 present truth use the powers of Satan to lie, to manipulate, to force, to coerce people with fear into submission? Yes, absolutely. It's happened to me. I know it's happened to a ton of people. 501c3 present truth is not innocent from using the power of Satan to govern its people, right? That's anyone or anything. Doesn't matter the religious group, doesn't matter the government, doesn't matter the financial institution, the family, or the educational system. Anyone or anything that uses the character, the method, the principles of Satan from the knowledge of good and evil carry the image of the beast in their mind. If they know it or not, they may know it, they may not know it. But if you use the character, method, the principles of Satan in the knowledge of good and evil, you carry the image of the beast right and it's the same exact thing for those who use the character the method and the principles of God's agape love if you do God's agape love if you know it or not you have the image of God in your mind this is very important Christians burning witches that was satanic communists killing religious people is satanic Muslims ki killing infidels is satanic. Christians condemning gay people, straight people, transgender is satanic. Because when you use the satanic principle of condemnation to force people to God, you're actually using Satan's principles to do it. It's impossible. Salvation does not work that way. It's very important. Matthew 7:21. Matthew chapter 7 verse 21 not everyone that saith unto me Lord Lord shall enter into the kingdom of heaven but he that does the will of my father which is in heaven many will say to me in that day Lord Lord have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name have cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works then I will profess unto them I never knew you 
Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. We're talking about Christians who work iniquity. Christians who use Satan's system. That's very important. Depart from me, you that work in Satan's system of iniquity, which comes from the knowledge of good and evil. That's very important. Revelation 18.2. Revelation 18 2 and he cried mightily unto me saying with a strong voice Babylon the great is fallen is fallen and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird for all nations all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues, for her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. I'm not condemning anybody if you fall into any one of these seven heads that govern mankind. I'm not condemning Muslims. I'm not condemning Roman Catholics. I'm not condemning Eastern mysticism, pantheists, new, none, none of that. God loves you. God desires to have a, a, a close relationship with you. And he desires that you get to know and understand who he is. But the Bible says to come out of every part of the entire satanic system of Babylon. Whatever your head you are under, come out of it. Whatever satanic power that you use, come out of it. Come out because this system, the entire satanic system of ten horns and seven heads, this is a self-destructive system. It will destroy you as it destroys itself. Very important. So in Revelation 13 and 17, we see two beasts. Revelation 13, the first beast runs the world with the ten powers of Satan and the seven heads of Satan. These are the powers and the, the ideologies that run mankind. Revelation 13 is Satan's entire worldwide system prior to the false second coming. Revelation 17 is the, the beast that runs the world after the false second coming. When you compare the two, right, you see Revelation 13, 1 to 4. You see a beast coming out of the sea. We know that that sea represents the people. We know that. You see, its body is described as the body of a leopard. That has elements of Greece. It has the feet of a bear. That's elements of Medo-Persia. It has the mouth of a lion. Right? That's elements of Babylon. It has seven heads blasphemy in the head only that's an important point it has ten horns and ten crowns one head is wounded but the people worship the beast not the wounded head that's important this is the world prior to the false second coming fast forward to revelation 17 this the beast comes out of the bottomless pit Satan is the angel of the bottomless pit. The beast doesn't come from the sea. It comes from where Satan is. Satan gives this beast its power. So this worldwide system, this comes from Satan himself at the false second coming, not the people. It has seven heads, it has ten horns, and it has no crowns. That's important. It's a different, it's a change, it's a transformation of a worldwide system. Right? It's a scarlet colored beast. It's a scarlet colored beast. Because every aspect of this beast reflects the red dragon of the bottomless pit. This, this beast of Revelation 17 is full of the name of blasphemy all over its body, not just the head. That means the entire body of humanity that forms this beast is now blasphemous, not just the heads. Right? This beast is what the world becomes after the false second coming, when Satan brings the ultimate and final form of the knowledge of good and evil. Right? 
the false second coming is a reality. This thing is going to happen. There will be economic crash, war, pestilence, famine. Then a false second coming. When this happens, Satan will appear as Christ and he'll present the knowledge of good and evil in such a way that it deceives the world, the same way it deceived Eve. And when he does this, he'll present the knowledge of good and evil in its most complete and corrupted form. And this will make the entire world perfectly corrupted spiritually. In Satan's eyes, it'll be a perfectly corrupted spirituality. 2 Timothy 3.1 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 says this, This also know that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, no agape, truce bakers, false accusers, false accusers incontinent, no self-control, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. This is a good description of what the world is going to look like under the false second coming and the beast of Revelation 17, which has turned entirely spiritually corrupt. John chapter 8, verse 12. John chapter 8 verse 12 says this Then Jesus spake unto them saying I am the light of the world he that followeth me shall not walk in darkness but shall have the light of life Right Revelation 14:4 4 says that these 144,000 they're not defiled with women they're not defiled by the satanic religious systems that use the power of the knowledge of good and evil they follow Jesus they follow the lamb they follow truth whithersoever it goes and the Bible says John 8 12 when you follow Jesus you have the light of the world and you cannot walk in the darkness of Satan's lies Matthew 24 21 Matthew chapter 24 verse 21 for then shall be the great tribulation such was not since the beginning of the world to this time no nor ever shall be and except those days be shortened there shall no flesh be saved but for the elect's sake those days shall be shortened then if any man say unto you lo here is Christ or there believe it not for there shall arise false Christ false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders in so much that if it were possible they shall deceive the very elect behold I have told you before therefore if they say unto you behold he is in the desert go forth not behold he is in the secret chambers believe it not the great tribulation of the false second is coming the midnight hour, earth's darkest moment in history is coming. And the only way to prepare for it and endure through it is through Jesus. The only way that Jesus can show us the truth of God's agape love is if we believe his testimony. That if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. When you believe this, when you fixate your mind on it, Jesus will shape and mold you in God's agape love. Only this can strengthen us to get through the time of trouble. Only this can strengthen us through the time of the shaking. Only Jesus can strengthen us in God's agape love to get us through the false second coming. Only Jesus can do this. Only Jesus can help us overcome sin, self, Satan, and the world which will enforce the image, the name, the number, and the mark of the beast, which will be the final and completed form of the knowledge of good and evil that Satan brings at the false second coming, character of God movement. We need to prepare for this.
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessings of warning from Jesus Christ himself. We thank you for all these puzzle pieces together for us so that we can know, we can understand, and that we can trust you to make us ready. Heavenly Father, you are holding back the winds of strife right now to shape and mold us in agape completely. Heavenly Father, where our mind has unbelief, help us in our unbelief. Where we falter and shake at the times when evil comes out of us, help us to see what it is, a revelation of what's still inside of us and what needs to come out. And help us to embrace all these rough things in life which are allowed to shape and mold us in agape. We do need protection from Satan. We do need the spiritual food and the spiritual clothing, but we know that you provide these things. Heavenly Father, bless us all with the Spirit as a river. In Jesus' name, amen. I appreciate y'all. Thanks for coming, Buck. Good to see you, Denise.